I mean, if you're shipping something that takes like 30, uh, 40 to 60 days, then something must be really wrong, right? That's the reason why everyone's complaining, oh, drop shipping is not possible. But with more and more like, you know, DHL UPS coming out with all this kind of like cheap um, direct services is going to make like uh, drop shipping even easier to do because like once, once the shipping time problem is solved, it's going to be like everyone's, everyone's going to start, uh, everyone's going to start like not stocking inventory in US. You know, I mean, a lot of people preach about like stocking inventory, but for the newbie, right, for someone, let's say I'm just like, I have a nine to five job and I'm just starting out. I don't have much savings. Ask them to stock up like five, six thousand in it's in stock. It's definitely something I highly, highly don't recommend because when you're just starting out, you don't know how to do product research. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Robust Marketer. Today I have a historic event, which is my first repeat podcast guest. Uh, and it was our biggest podcast guest. We have Steve Tan. Uh, and if you haven't uh, met Steve Tan before or you haven't heard about his story, just do a little Googling. Check out his Facebook group, uh, Ecom Elites uh, Mastermind. And you'll see that the, the, uh, Steve and his brother Evan have just been uh, you know, working at the highest level of e-commerce now for a long time. Uh, basically broke into the game big in 2008 uh, and have been scaling hard and fast ever since. Uh, we had a great podcast last time, so I'm super happy to have him back on the show. Welcome to the Robust Marketer, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Eric. Thank you so much for having us back again. Super excited to share more valuable and golden nuggets with your viewers at all. Yeah, that's uh, well, that's fantastic. I'm sure they're excited as well. So, um, you know, we usually start with the hero's journey. I was just going over our, uh, our last podcast where we discussed um, sort of how you broke into the game. And so we don't really need to go back into that. But the main thing that I wanted to ask about was how much has changed since we last spoke. So we last spoke, I think, in, I think, probably September into, of 2017. Um, mm -hmm. So just under a year. And, and the only constant in this business is change. Uh, and so I'm just curious, in, in, your, it, in your business particularly, what's been, what have been some of the biggest changes over the, the last year? I think the biggest changes probably primarily focused on Facebook. So a lot of people are like, you know, bitching about like Facebook algorithms, updating, constantly updating, changing. So it's hard to profit from the front end sale, right? So I think primarily we're, uh, we're switching over to like, you know, focusing more on lifetime value and like upsells, downsells, so and so forth, rather than just like, you know, last time our focus is probably more on like just front end, you know, as long as the front end makes money, it's good. But now we're focusing a lot on email marketing. We have like a, a really good partner working on that for us. So I like would just try to like salvage as much sales as much as possible rather than just bitching about like Facebook, which is something that you can't control, right? So if you want to be in the game, you have to adapt and like, you know, adjust accordingly to what Facebook or Google comes up to you and not the opposite, right? So uh, th that's the kind of things we have been sharing in the group, telling people like, if you want to be in the game, you have to adjust and adapt. It's nothing like you, you can't ask Facebook to adjust for you because like even, I, I don't care whether you're spending 1 million, 2 million, 3 million per month, it's peanuts to what Facebook is getting from all the advertisers worldwide, right? So your feedback doesn't really matter because Facebook only cares about like customer satisfaction, customer's feedback. They are doing a lot of post-purchase customer uh, feedback notifications to people. You know, they have all the pixels data, right? So they're doing a lot of follow-ups to make sure they are only allowing legit advertisers on the platform. So it's still good to be uh, playing legit in the long run rather than just for the short term. Of course, short term for probably for the cash flow, but once you have more cash flow, uh, I would highly suggest people to like, you know, do legit stuff, like not, not selling some like, you know, copyrighted stuff, some like, you know, um, selling A but shipping B product. It's, it's not going to last long term and it's just going to, make the whole landscape harder for everyone in the whole game. Yeah, I, I think so. And this is the theme I hear echoed across everything. We just did this big <laughs> expert survey where that we interviewed uh -huh. 500 people uh, and, and we, we took a look at their answers. We took a look at how much money they said they made and, and we took a look at their repeat customer rate. And there was like a massive correlation, obviously, uh, between the people that concentrated on, on, you know, having that customer and then reusing that customer again and again like that's the hardest thing in the world to do is get a customer so once you have mm -hmm. you better be putting systems into place to reach yeah for sure again. so you definitely, said email definitely. is is your pro like 
Can you give us a, a, a nugget or anything around, so like specifically around email? Like, what are the what are the core sequences you want to be running on on via email to repeat customers? I, I think for us, I'm definitely not good at email. I just have to be upfront here. I um, I don't know shit about email until like you know all these partners came on board and helped us with set up with everything. So the the core ones that I'll definitely want to use is at least like you know abandoned cart email. That's definitely for sure. So a lot of people are using apps and a lot of different kind of like um, um, softwares to you to do the follow up email. Sometimes I've heard people doing like seven figures per month and using Shopify's native uh, abandoned cart email, which is kind of like silly because there are so so little things you could customize inside like um, the default Shopify one. So we use everything in Clavio. So we do like our abandoned cart sequences, our thank you emails, everything is follow up through like Clearview. So we have all the data and it, it, it makes sense for you to just check all your data from one point of source rather than like checking one from Shopify, one from like uh, abandoned cart ad or whichever and the other one from Clearview. It, it makes marketing a little bit tougher. So we, we migrated every single thing that's email related to Clearview and we do all the sequences from there. We have like, you know, post purchase, thank you emails, we have referral emails, satisfaction emails, and everything. So it's it's kind of building more on the brand long term. And our emails are really different for branded stores and like for kind of general drop shipping or kind of like I don't know gadget store kind of thing. It's currently it's really different. So for our like branded stores, we focus a lot on content. So we'll, we're gonna sh uh, we're gonna like usually we'll do like a soft uh, our content plus a soft sell uh, soft sell. So we don't we don't go really aggressive like hey buy this now you know it's like all right the, this is like something like kind of like uh, Ezra's kind of methods like you know we study his methods a lot as well so he does a lot he does give a lot of content you know and he doesn't sell much so it's usually more like you know he he puts them through a funnel our way of doing it is slightly different we do it more on like you know uh, how does this product is gonna adjust and help you in the long run and like it. And like if you, you're interested, check this out here. So it goes through another page, and um, it will just bring them on to the whole sequence again. And they get retargeted if they don't buy, and like you know they will be put on like and all these different kind of sequences if they do a lot of different kind of actions. And this goes across email, so internal communications as well as as just retargeting sequences as well. On Facebook. Yes, yes, yes. So are you, I mean, are you email... doing things like excluding audiences after they've seen a certain creative, and then hitting them up with another one? No, like, are you you know segmenting them in that sort of like storytelling way at all? Uh, we don't use it often, but we're starting to test it after like you know the um, the Shopify private mastermind, right? I've seen a lot of people being really really creative with like retargeting. Our guys, some of our um, some of our teams does that a lot because we have a few media buying teams, right? So some of them do does it, some of them don't do it. So uh, it's we're still testing it to see which ones uh, are really really. I mean. You can be really creative on that, but uh, at the end of the day, it boils down to results, right? I mean, like you can be super creative, but it doesn't bring you sales or any results. It doesn't matter at all. So we're still testing it. So I, I can't really comment on like whether it's really effective, but from what I've heard and what I've seen or like, you know, some experts doing it, I think it's still like a very interesting way of like showing a lot of different creatives and funneling through them like a, uh, step ABC. I think it's pretty good. I, I like the idea a lot. So we're, we're going to test it and see how it goes. Nice. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many, so many options and so many really interesting things came out of that Shopify mastermind in, uh, yeah, for sure. in, in Atlanta. Um, but I wanted to ask you, do you ever, do you use things like one of the things that's come to my attention recently, um, is glue, uh, glue.io. So, so just basically tools to segment your audience. So not only are you remarketing to people, um, based on their their purchase activity, but also their like per purchase recent recency and purchase frequency, so that you'd be hitting people up in sort of like, hey, it's you know you, you bought three months ago, maybe you know it's time to re 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 go out to you again specifically. Are you using any of these mm -hmm. tools to segment your audiences in that way? No, uh, I haven't even heard. Sorry, I'm sorry, I haven't heard of Glue.io, but uh, we do segmenting through like Clavio. It's like we do all the segmentations throughout inside there. And you can easily export it and use it to upload it to like um, Facebook to remarket it to them if you have any like uh, so we try to use as little tools as much as possible because the more tools you have the more apps you have the slower your, your site is definitely going to load doesn't matter how optimized your site is because a lot of them are pinging uh, third party servers externally from your site so it's going to pull um, you know slow down the whole site which ideally we don't want that because that I mean you're spending a lot of money 
driving customers to your website and a lot a lot of them bounce you're just losing money on the upfront directly yeah and site speed is the hidden giant in any form of internet marketing that that you, you can't take it seriously enough you know like uh, the amount, the time, the time that, that your site takes to load has a direct correlation with how many people bounce. Are there any things that like, are there things that you do specifically proactively to help with site times? Uh, I mean, like a lot of newbies, especially kind of thought like, you know, uh, the more apps I have, right, the better yeah. the store is going to perform. Right. Yeah. I think that's the, that, that's the kind of like, um, that, um, wrong conception that it, it, it's going to help you a lot. For sure, ads is here to help you get better sales, but if you kind of use a lot in the wrong way, it's going to slow down everything. So we do like optimize a lot of our images, like our, uh, we do go through our HTML to see like every time when an app is removed, not necessarily everything is cleaned up properly. So sometimes there might be like, you know, codes that's left there. So we have our developers to uh, front end developers going check the codes whether everything's correct, you know, everything's cleaned up properly. We do frequent like uh, speed tests on sites to check if there's anything else we could optimize with like from script point, from the code point or from the, um, you know, pictures, images and or anything, or is there any app that's really slowing down the whole site? Because if you run it through like, you know, uh, GT metrics or some other uh, free tools that you could use, you could easily see like go through the waterfall um, there's, there's a section called waterfall. If you just go through that, you can see which tools that, or which external sites is uh, like uh, taking how much time to load. And once your developer goes through all that, you could easily see, uh, you know, which ones are the apps that's slowing down your site a long time, right? So, but ideally you need to retest it a few times because sometimes it's dependent on the, the testing site because they use different servers, right? So sometimes uh, they might give wrong information. So you need to do like three, four times and just make sure if it's always consistently the same app or same uh, software or whichever, then you need to do something about it. Yeah, because it will have a, have a have a pretty drastic impact on your on your bouncer. Yeah. Yes. So so one of the uh, I I can't remember the software that uh, it records all the actions. Do you uh, do you know the app? Oh, I, um, I've heard of this. Yeah, I forget what it's called though. I can't remember off my head right now. Yeah. So it kind of records uh, all like the, you, you, there's options to record everything, right? So we kind of use that because we are doing a lot of conversion rate optimization to see which which steps, uh, um, what what are the users doing and everything. And we realized that like, um, because we're not experts in this. So we kind of found an expert and he kind of like made only sites that's relevant. They only record this. They do not record everything. And the good thing about this is like, you don't have, because they charge you based on the amount of uh, heat maps or whichever recorded sessions, right? So if you're recording everything, you use up your credits really quickly. So basically this expert comes in, like he tags, he, I don't, I don't even know how he does it. He set up some settings, you know, excludes some pages and only records the ones that's necessary. It speeds up the front end site and like, you know, slow down a little bit on the back end, but you know, at least we get the critical data required and not slowing down the entire site. Yeah, yeah. so, so nice. yeah, I mean, th those are the things that we, I think a lot of people need to kind of take note because like, if you don't know what you're doing, like even like, I, like sometimes myself, like testing new apps or whichever, we don't even know what we're doing. We just wanna see if this tool is helpful. And sometimes it might have like, you know, um, you know, slow, slow, slow site speed for your, for your site, yeah. So one of the things I, I've heard you say a number of times now that I think, that I think is really cool, and I, I hear a lot of high-level uh, operators uh, talk like this as well, it's like you know your limitations and you know when to find an expert. And so it's three times in this conversation now you said, I went, I got an expert, I got an expert, I got an expert, which is yeah. super, super smart, right? Like why, you know, if you can accelerate your learnings that quickly by, by going and partnering with someone. So is that a way that your business has changed in the past year? Like are you, are you because you guys have elevated and you've gotten such visibility, you probably have a whole list of like mentors as well that you've kind of connected with. Talk a little bit about, about you, you, the experts that you've kind of, uh, you know, hooked up with. So kind of there, are, I would say they're not really like experts that they are in the public eye. We'll just go into like, you know, we'll check out all the top, you know, people, as far as, for example, conversion rate optimization, right? We'll check out all the top people. We'll check out Google. We'll check out all the people in Upwork. We'll make a list of all the people that we are interested to work with. We'll reach out to them, tell them our stats. 
what we want to improve and see if they're going to be a good fit. So I think the concept of like, um, this hasn't been new for us. We have been always working with a lot of people, like, you know, people that we believe can make a change because like since in my early days in college, I have been hiring professors to write my essays because I just felt I'm not the best person to do it. Right. So, uh, I mean, it's the best use of your time and like the best ROI, right? Because like if I'm going to spend one week in writing my essay, whether this professor could do it in one day, you know, it does, it doesn't make sense at all. So same thing for conversion rate optimization. If like, you know, there's a few, there's a few really good ones on Upwork and they do charge premiums for it. And same goes for email marketing. I know we work with like a few guys as well in a group, you know, uh, one of them is like Joshua. He's like, uh, he's really good in email marketing. So we highly recommend him as well. And like he helps us with some of our branded sites for email follow-ups and everything. I mean, we don't really want to do everything just in-house. I mean, we have the people in-house, but I mean, it doesn't mean that if you have your guy in-house, he's necessarily going to be the best. That's for sure not going to happen, right? So you're going to be like training all these people. You're going to be, in order to train someone, you have to be good at it first, right? Or else you'll be teaching him like garbage or you're just throwing him like, all right, read this course, right? Yep. Which, you know, most of the time it, it's not going to be like really efficient. So as long as it's not uh, like going to be overly expensive, or if it's gonna really easily justify the ROI, we're just gonna we just use it a lot. We use a lot uh, a lot of um, you know experts in this space. Like even we have our own front end developers. Sometimes we split test new developers to see if they could help us get our um, our speed even faster as well. Cool. Um, okay, so there's another question I want to ask because I know you've I know that you have been like I know you you've talked with Kam Mizra. I know you've got this network of these great people, and I and I'm always interested in the sort of high level learnings that you can get from from people like that. But I'll I'll leave that till the end a little bit more. I wanted to talk. There was so you talked about how your business has changed, where you're putting a real focus on the back end on on making the most out of customers when you have them. But I want, have you noticed changes in the focus, like the strategy of the, the front end of your business? So you mentioned, uh, you know, gadget stores or, you know, like uh, general stores versus niche stores versus branded stores. What sort of trends uh-huh. have you seen in, in that kind of thing? And, and ultimately I want to know, like if, if people are starting out today, what do you, what do you recommend that, that people kind of go towards in order to get in? So start with, with your business and, and what changes you've seen in the landscape in regards to the, the strategy. I don't think there's much changes to be honest. It's always still like the same things going on. As I mentioned just now, it's pretty much more about the focus on Facebook, right? So everything is still the same. It's just whether you're making ROI based on your front end and back end, right? So if you're spend, if you're able to spend like twenty dollars CPA and wherever I'm able to spend thirty five to fifty dollars CPA, I'm gonna be easily outbidding you. I'm gonna be able to continue running the traffic. Where, where I'm in the green and you're going to be in the red, right? So I think that's the, pretty much the change this year where a lot of people are finding it hard to profit from the front end, right? Gotcha. If they don't have like a really good like a, a product, uh, I mean, it's it's still, I still see a lot of people crushing it and it's, it's usually the people that's like really underground. They don't share any stats. They don't, they're not public about anything at all. They're doing like a one or two million every single month, just like just doing their stuff. And like if, if, if it's like if drop shipping they, and these guys are 100% drop shipping, they have no warehouse, they have no local ground stuff. The reason why I know about all this is, is because they have been uh, c- coming to me and asking me to do J- from probably 1 million to 5 million or 10 million per month. So uh, that's that's the reason why I get to like, you know, meet all these different guys because like if they don't have any fulfillment, they don't have any warehouse. So. I'm glad that like you know, a lot of people crushing it. It only goes to show that like you know drop shipping is still a huge huge market. Not necessarily just drop shipping, but the whole e-commerce landscape, Shopify plus you know shipping products from China, it's still gonna work out pretty well. And the good thing about it is like there's more and more different kind of shipping companies coming out. Not new shipping companies, but new services like DHL, UPS with the kind of e-packet. So like DHL e-commerce. It's kind of one of the up and coming ones that we have been using two years ago. Like when no one's or when no one's using it, we have been using it. That's why our shipping times are pretty quick. I've been sharing these resources. A lot of people can't use them because they like some of the suppliers don't have this uh, resource to like use this company. And but it's getting more and more common. So like the only reason why people are bitching about drop shipping is because like they get low feedback score. But if you're doing all the things properly, like you know, checking the uh, buying 
like samples to check the product before you start selling or have like a legit supplier that 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 you work with on the long term who won't screw you up or you have like you know working with like legit or good shipping company you're going to get your product to your customers within like seven to ten days or at most two weeks right i mean two weeks shipping time i think is still reasonable be in europe like uh even if we ship to like um uk it takes about less than 10 days for our product to go from china to so, I mean, it's no problem for us as long. I mean, if you're shipping something that takes like 30, uh, 40 to 60 days, then something must be really wrong, right? That's the reason why everyone's complaining, oh, drop shipping is not possible. But with more and more like, you know, DHL, UPS coming out with all this kind of like cheap um, direct services is going to make like uh, drop shipping even easier to do. Because like once, once the shipping time problem is solved, it's going to be like everyone's everyone's going to start uh, everyone's going to start like not stocking inventory in US you know i mean a lot of people preach about like stocking inventory but for the newbie right for someone let's say i'm just like i have a 9 to 5 job and i'm just starting out i don't have much savings ask them to stock up like 5 6000 in it's in stock it's definitely something i highly highly don't recommend because when you're just starting out you don't know how to do product research you don't you don't have a good sense of eye for what kind of products gonna sell well and you stock inventory, you stock you do your branded stuff, you do your white label and you list it and you're not gonna sell anything. And you, that's that's five thousand burn. So I'll just stick with my recommendations and like you know, when you're starting out, I think it's still good to kind of like play small, you know, get 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 a whole get a whole um business model thought up first prior to going hard into it. So I mean dropshipping is definitely good. I'm not saying um, branded, going the branded or niche store model is not good. I'm just saying that it's a step-by-step -step process. You have to be good at first at like, you know, beginners, beginner stuff, learn how to crawl first before you learn how to run or fly, right? I, I don't expect someone new to go from zero to like fly all the way up in like, you know, a few days. So it's, yeah, just being and, realistic here. And it's going to take you that and you're going to have to go through, like a lot of people are going to go through the low quality e-commerce to start. They're going to go in and that's how you have to start. You start, you start flipping stuff on AliExpress and there's still an yeah. opportunity for that. Um, but sure, it's just a sure. matter of, of, but I, it's something Nick Peroni talks a lot about as well is that like holistic strategy is sort of have a, don't just start with like, I'm going to flip shit from China. Like start with me, start with that as an idea, but then sort of like build around it and build, build your audience, build your, who, you know, who you're going for, what kind of product, build the story of your store, like just mm -hmm. sort of, and then, you know, have an email, pro, you know, provider in mind and, and all of these kinds of things. But I wanted to ask you, so you, are you guys doing some branded stuff as well? Yeah. So we and do what, have our own. What, what's your experience been like with that? I mean, it's definitely way higher AOV and like lifetime value definitely is going to be better. But um, not the only thing that's not um, like sometimes you don't get really motivated because the sales are definitely not as high at the general stores. That's the cold hot truth, right? You know, like, I mean, you can be super good at branding and everything, but I mean, the volume, if you're going to a smaller niche, is definitely not going to be as like, you know, you're not going to be talking about seven figures per month. You're just going to probably be talking about low six figures. But probably these kind of stores will be there for a very long time, right? Compared to like, you know, like pump and dump stores would last only a few months or probably like five, six months. So, or, and you're not, most probably you're not going to be able to sell in general stores because like if you're moving such huge volume, probably the only people that's going to like buy you is probably going to be like, you know, huge, like you know, huge Amazon or all this kind of the Google, but they're not going to buy you because like you're just selling random stuff. Right. So, I mean, in terms of like, um, in terms of selling your store, I think definitely niche or branded stores has a way better opportunity compared to like just, uh, you know, normal general, general if, your goal is store. It. if your goal is, yeah. to, is to flip it. Yeah. So have you, have you sold any source stores, stores before? No, I haven't sold any before. So it, it's something new to me. It's definitely something new. But I will, after I heard Ezra's talk at like, you know, oh, definitely, yeah, sure. Why not? So probably uh, build something that I could sell every every two years for like a few million. That, that would be great too, you know? Yeah, that would be yeah. just fine. That's yeah. uh, that's really cool. That's Yeah, that's the, the cold hard truth about it still not being the same the same upfront money, but again, it's that long-term thing, and 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 who knows? And uh, you know, after five years, it'll be interesting yeah. to see whether th those ones that keep churning uh, can can get because they can get bigger and bigger as you build the brand out.
Yeah, for sure. So it's 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 well, you have to weigh what you want, really. So and, and even in our mastermind, you know, I told I lay out everything to for for all my students, and I just tell them like, you, you want cash flow or you want brand for a long term. You, you have to if you're in the in financial good shape, you could support both models at the same time. But if you're just starting out or if you're, if you're just like still struggling, you should just focus on one, then build the other one when you're like in better financial position because. Building a real brand definitely takes a lot of energy and focus and money for sure. Whereas like dropshipping, like if something doesn't work, you can just throw it away, right? You can just yeah. uh, test a new product. But if you're building something customized, not we're not talking about like just white label stuff. You're, if you're building like R&D, you're doing your own injection moldings, you're doing your own manufacturing, that's going to be super high risk. Right? Which you've done, right? You did that. You did that yeah. prior to your big to your dropshipping career, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, in between yeah. your I two dropshipping all... careers. Yeah, kind of. Uh, we, yeah, we did all that. It, one of both did work out okay, but it, like one was our scam. The other one didn't work out the um, the amount of numbers or quantity that we want to move. So I kind of I'm really careful about going deep diving into like a new brand because like I kind of know what it takes to build something like that. You're gonna be really really proud of. That you're gonna be like, wow! Well, you want to share for everybody. You, that you're gonna be like, oh yeah, this is my everything. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's an entrepreneur's kind of ego kind of thing, right? So I kind of like went through all that prep, so I kind of understand where I'm comfortable at and where I want to be, right? So I kind of like understand everyone wants to be entrepreneurs and everyone wants to be like, oh yeah, I build a startup in Silicon Valley. You know, I do all that kind of prep, right? So it's it's good, but you have to be realistic. Ninety nine per ninety nine point nine percent of all um you know startups fail, and only the like you know only the few percent like Facebook and all this kind of are uh, kind of like made it long term and uh, able to survive. That's the cold hard truth, right? I mean like even incubators, you know, even with such a good sense of uh like um, investment and or like you know all five hundred startups and all these kind of uh, incubators uh, VCs. I mean, majority of, of all their investments fail. It's only because one or two or three of like the, the ones that made it really big that covers all their their investments. So I mean, it's it's tough. I mean, and it's the really biggest tough of them to... all, the biggest of them all are still failing in a lot of cases. You know, the biggest yeah. of them all still don't literally make profit, which is the craziest yeah. thing, right? <laughs> That's why. So uh, I mean, it's like when sometimes when I was doing my uh, when I was doing Uvo the tracker. So I was kind of thinking like, oh, I could do the freemium model, right? So I kind of like thought I could do that. And like uh, the reason why some of the companies are able to do that is because they have a very deep pocket, a treasure chest to do all the marketing and everything. And if you're just a startup and you don't, I, and I, I do have like almost 800,000 US for that startup. And like, it's just gone in like really quickly when you want to build the perfect brand, the perfect marketing sequence and everything. Manufacturing takes up a lot of money. If you like, I know I'm, I'm like kind of new into like, you know, electronic smart uh, manufacturing, but it definitely takes up a lot of money if you don't know what you're doing. So ideally it's always best to just do white labels to start so that you, you just buy like the absolute minimum order quantity, like just put on your, your brand get this started first test out the market once you have like good demand good like everything then move on to the next step i think that's the safest way you know and only reasons why some of the companies do like you know it's either they have a really cool product they have a really sick industrial design or they have some really sick you know uh like features or functions that like everyone wants it so yeah but there are just so many lessons you can learn doing it the fast way that you'll need if you're going to build it the long way anyway. So you might as well get those lessons out of the way cheaply yeah, before yeah. you make yeah, a big yeah, investment sure. in the other way, right? For sure. But I think, uh, yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. Um, I wanted to ask you also about, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is, is hard, you know, one of the things, again, in the survey that came up was team building and, and sort of the, the way you go about building um, – building your team, who, who your hires should be. So I'm wondering, you've got you and your brother who are, you know, full on in this business. I'm wondering how many, how many like high level people have you hired who are sort of like your right hand people? I'm sure you've got a network of VAs and um, different, different things like that, but how many like high level people have you hired and how did you find them? Most of the high level people, you can't find them on Upwork. I'll uh, just be honest about it because like you, you're talking about people's that's going to be your right hand man, right? So a lot of people are like having low. So in our mastermind, so I was even telling people, so how, how much are you willing to pay for this person? 
He said, all right, 2000. So I said, you're expecting to pay 2000 for someone that's going to replace you completely. Like, you know, I was like, so you're only worth $2,000 right now. He said, no, I'm worth like, you know, 20, 30 K. So why are you only willing to pay that amount? Right. It doesn't matter where this person is based in the U S or in the Philippines, but it, it's all about like, um, uh, you have to know how much you're willing to pay in order to have someone replace you in, entirely in marketing or entirely in like, you know, operation. So, I mean, we do have like a few right hand men, so definitely Evan is one of them. So Evan pretty much takes care of everything and manages the whole team right now. So, uh, I'm probably more like the president, like, you know, the director, uh, like, you know, I don't really manage all the day to day operations anymore. I'm just the checks- board. Yeah, kind of like chairman. So Evan's probably like CEO right now. Then like, you know, we have do have like a few like COOs, CMOs, like, you know, people running the whole operation. So like the project manager is one of definitely one of our key level, which is why we preach a lot having because like a lot of people thought like, you know, running an entire e-commerce on a big scale, is really easy doing it, everything yourself. Definitely for sure. I have a few students that's doing like high six figures and they're only like two person team. I was like, come on, right? You you have the you have budget, you have the know how, right? Why are you guys just doing like I think ten I have ten guys in my last mastermind in US doing like six to seven figures and only less than three people. And they're like they are they're struggling, they're breaking down, they're like drowning because of like they're doing all the emails themselves, they're like, you know, hustling and they, some of them do have like a full time job, right? So it only comes to show, yeah, I was like, come on, man, seriously. So, that, I mean, we broke down everything during the mastermind, tell them which step to go through. And like, they, like you know, for us, we use LinkedIn a lot because like that's where you poach high level people, you know, and, and it's kind of like the shortcut because like somebody has already trained them for you, right? Yeah. You just have to pay premium to get these guys over. So you don't have to go through all of the, like if, so something that I always tell them is, is like, if you're paying shit, you're gonna get shit in return, right? I, I mean, that's 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 really true because like you don't expect to pay some two hundred dollars and expect them to be your COO or expect to or why are they why are they crap or mm-hmm. if you don't have any if you don't have any SOPs or you don't have any training materials and you expect them to when you hire them they expect to do that do everything that's not gonna happen and that's why I stopped bitching about it like why these guys are crap because most likely they are crap because of you not providing proper training or like not telling them what to do. I, I think that's, um, you know, something that I always tell them. I think it's one of the hardest things to, to, to get good at delegating and, and to be able to be, be able to build a structure that allows you to delegate. I think it's one of the most important things for entrepreneurs to be able to enjoy their lives as well as grow their business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you say, okay. and I'm, I'm interested in, in where you're at with that. Like you, you obviously are an incredibly driven person. You're building out your info business. You're building out your, uh, you know, your, your e-com, obviously are, you might be building a SaaS product. I'm sure most of them, that's the triple threat. You need to build out your a SaaS product as well. Yeah. Uh, but I'm uh-huh. wondering how, how is your work-life balance and like, what are the things like, uh, how is your work-life balance and, and what are your goals over the next like five years? Um, I don't exactly have like super long-term goals to be honest, because like, I kind of felt like, you know, I mean, probably because of all the startups I did before, you know, like you, you have like some like five, 10 year goals where your where your brand want to be. I think we'll just take things slowly, kind of like, you know, at our comfort zone, just to make sure like, you know, uh, everything's, we're doing it like, you know, with, and we're enjoying the whole process, not rushing, you know, not stressing ourselves out. I, I know people doing like, you know, 70, 80, 90 million dollars per year on Shopify and they're rushing to do like, you know, public listing they are stressed because sometimes Facebook's algorithm, they have like three, 400 staffs in Philippines. They have huge overheads. So we, we don't have all that crap. So, I mean, like we're just taking it step by step, doing some, um, in, in our, doing foc- our main focus would be like e-commerce. So kind of, we kind of deviated in a way to cryptocurrency because like the money was just so good. You know, kind of like brought our focus back to e-commerce, just like doing our own thing because like e-commerce is our bread and butter, right? We're, we're, we shouldn't be like forgetting where we came from. So, so I cashed out all my principal in cryptocurrency. I'm just leaving everything for like to the moon. I'll just leave it like five years. And I'll just check it. I, I deleted all my apps for cryptocurrency just so that I could focus on like, you know, my e-commerce business. Then the e-commerce business came along info, info and some mastermind. Mastermind is probably more for like, you know, 
um, and getting more people, high level people, because people that comes to my mastermind, usually people doing like at least like six, seven, eight figures per year. So I get to meet a lot of people, you know, I get to, I get to travel at the same time. So, I mean, it's really cool. So probably, yeah, SAS is, uh, SAS is definitely in our, uh, was one of our pipelines as well. And like, yeah, we're planning to build up some platforms to help out more people in using, doing like e-commerce, drop shipping and everything. Yeah. That's kind what of, do you do to relax? Um, we do a lot of partying. <laughs> it's pretty we party relaxing. Party a lot, yeah. Party, like I do a lot of like massage. I I do I go for like you know I go for like massage, relaxing. I do some. I I go to uh, chiropractor to like kind of get my whole body adjusted because I'm spending so much time on the computer, so I get a lot of like pains through my shoulders and everything. Which I I this year is probably more a lot. I'm gonna do some really like goals like probably not for business but more on like personal so i'm gonna i'm gonna i want to uh, lose 10 kg i'm well, gonna do meditation i'm gonna do meditation every single morning i want to do all that kind of like you know uh holy like you know kind of things that's gonna help my body even more so yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, my, it's like uh... you're gonna come to a point where you're like you, you're gonna spend money to kind of like you know pay doctors and everything so i don't want to get to the stage where i have to pay doctors to kind of like you know eat a lot of medications so yeah i think more that's, on like yeah i think that's a really interesting thing it's you know meditation is something everyone knows you should do and it's the easiest thing in the world to do because you just have to do nothing but it's the hardest thing to do in the world it's, <laughs> it's just because yeah. you have to do nothing it's we're, we're sending my daughter, actually, my daughter's going to go to school in, uh, my, four, my four-year-old's going to school in uh, September, and she's going to this hippie school where they teach transcendental meditation from like a very young age. And I'm very excited about it because it's like, she'll finally do the thing that I talk about. And, uh, and maybe she can teach me to do it a little bit as well. But, but, but I, I, think it's, I think it's a great idea to set those kind of personal goals. And I think it's, it's something that's very common among our set of people, you know, the, the people that you meet at these masterminds. Like everyone is, is interested in, in, in improving their lives. And you're absolutely right. Like the old model of like live unconsciously until a doctor has to intervene and you've got to take a lot of medication yeah. and you've got to do all these things. Like that's not the model anymore, right? Like you have to be uh-huh. honest with yourself and, and sort of continually try to improve th- those things in your life. Yeah, for sure, man. For sure. Nice. Okay, cool. Well, we're coming up to the end of our half an hour here. Um, so I wanted to just say if there's, cause I know like, what are some of the takeaways that you've had from some of the higher end masterminds? Like what are, I guess, obviously meditate and, uh, you know, things, uh-huh. things like that. But are there any other takeaways you've had from, so actually first question, do you go to masterminds outside of your own to other high level entrepreneur masterminds that you pay for? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. What are the, some of the key takeaways you've gotten from those? Kind of like, um, I think, I think the key takeaways is like, you know, there's always like, you know, someone better than you. So you always have to stop, like never stop learning. And like, I mean, like, for example, like the info, info mastermind that we have been at Atlanta, kind of like gives us like perspective. Oh, there's so much potential in info space. Where are we not like, you know, monetizing or why aren't we go, going like, you know, putting effort. You know, I, it took us one full year to like, you know, barely put up our course because like we're just not motivated at all. Because like we have our own main business running and it's good, doing good ROI for us, so we thought, all right, well, why, why should we even do this? Because like it's so much work. You have to sit on your computer, you have to record all this boring stuff, right? So we kind of like you know. So Adam was like pushing up, like, hey, you guys should do something. I was like, all right, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. It took us one full year to put up our course, right? So yeah, I mean, it's like it, it gives us perspective on like what's the possibility. Like attending all this mastermind, seeing like, you know, I mean, you have to be positive in what's possible. You have to know what's possible before you are going to be motivated. So, for example, like when we've seen like people doing like, oh, eight figures, nine figures in different kind of cities, we see, oh, there's so much potential for us to get from where we are right now to where they're potentially at right now. So I think definitely um, it helps a lot with our mindset by attending all these masterminds. And like it helps us see how like all this uh, you know strong people like you know high level people are how they think how they structure the teams uh, what kind of like uh, what kind of models they do like you know it, it helps a lot with all this I mean primarily helping in business I wouldn't say it's um, because I haven't attended a lot of masterminds before some of the masterminds are probably more like focused on like you know business 
it's I think attending all these masterminds. One good thing is like if you if there are some hot seat concepts, it, it allows you to get multiple points of view from different entrepreneurs to see whether your business model works or whether like you know all these kind of things work, right? So well, it's I'll definitely say it's very helpful for a lot of people. You know, even myself included, I've attended like Tom's mastermind. I've attended a few more guys' mastermind. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely um, you know start also attending more. I'm gonna attend um. Nicholas Kuzmich, uh, mastermind as well. So I mean, like, it's it's just a never stop learning process, never stop learning process to kind of like you know learn from all these guys to see what what kind of different strategies they're using, how how's their funnels, um, what they're doing to capture leads and all this kind of stuff. Because we're we're good at media buying, but we're pretty new in info digital space. So it's kind of it might be slightly different. If not, I'm not sure. So I'm just wanna like you know learn. And you know, see if there's things that I could implement into e-commerce, or just things that I could implement into info space. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things that we could do for sure. Nice. Yeah, sky's the limit. That's for sure. Every time I come away from one of these things, you're also building your network in such an incredible way, right? You're meeting other experts that you can draw on later, and uh, I think yeah. it, it's just a just an unbelievable opportunity. So I wanted to take a minute too. We haven't talked about it yet, but we've got uh, ECML e-commerce mastery live coming up in July. I think you're also mm -hmm. speaking at Affiliate World Europe on uh, in Barcelona yeah. on the 18th and 19th. Have you been to yeah. Barcelona before? Yeah, I've been there once. I think yeah. Nice. I'm really excited about it. Do you know? Uh, do you know sort of what this? This I should be asking you this, but do you know what you're going to be talking about in in Barcelona at ECML? We haven't. I know we I, haven't finalized the topic yet, but so I'll just put you on the spot right now. Do you know? Do you know what you want to talk about? Um, not exactly because we have been discussing with Chad also what topic we're talking about. So we want to make sure both topics don't clash because I know a lot of people that attend. After World Europe is going to attend like the, yeah. um, the ECML as well. Just get so, tomatoes thrown at you if you start saying the same things. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's, it's it's kind of important, but I, I'm glad that it's not as long, so that you know we don't have to prepare so much content. So probably like we're gonna like, finalize this with Evan probably within this week with you. We're gonna discuss. Uh, we're gonna tell. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to do product research and um, you know, Affiliate World Europe. So we're gonna see what other topics we could add value to, like your your audience, to see like you know, probably we're gonna still finalize this everything by this week. Nice. Okay. Well, sure. Well, we'll make an announcement maybe when uh, when we drop this post in or something. We'll talk about okay, what, sure. your, what your actual topic will be. That sounds uh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on the Robust Marketer today, Steve. Say hi to your brother for me. Uh, check in. Sure, ha sure, have sure. you listened to the new Kanye album? Huh? No, not yet. Oh, I was as I know your brother's into the Yeezys, so I thought I thought you might. Yeah, Kanye West album, <laughs> pretty good. Should check okay. it out. Put it on and bang out some campaigns this afternoon. <laughs> All right, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Okay, bye. All right, talk to you soon. Bye.